Welcome back to another episode of the Virtually Agile podcast, folks. I'm your host, Chris Stone, the Virtual Agile Coach, and today we're trying something a little different on the show. A few months ago, I shared some content about 12 Agile podcasts that I listened to. I shared it on LinkedIn, and someone very correctly pointed out to me that my list wasn't as representative, representative as it could be. Now, I've always prided myself, and in particular on this show, of having a central theme around amplifying newer voices and celebrating diversity. So I wanted to do more, and thus we are switching up the formats. And I've been offering underrepresented demographics in the Agile world a platform to experience co-hosting a podcast themselves. And in doing so, I'm hoping to remove some of the barriers to getting started and hopefully help improve representation. And it begins today. So I'm very pleased to welcome my very first co-host to this show. It's Oana. Hi, Oana. How are you? And welcome to the show. Tell us a little bit more about yourself. Hi, Chris. Thank you so much for this opportunity. I love being here with you and uh, our lovely guest, Yuta. Uh, so my name is Juana Moraru. I am a freelance Scrum Master and Agile Coach at Scrumify.at. And in my free time, I'm also a singer in my band Ardenite and hopefully soon a podcast host myself. <laughs> Well, welcome and hopefully you enjoy the experience. Now, a little bit for our listeners. Awana, Yuta and I happen to have belted out a number of karaoke tunes at the Retrospective Facilitators Gathering in the Czech Republic uh, just a couple of months ago now. And Awana in particular and I, we belted out the Pokemon theme. Yes, we were the very best that, <laughs> that ever was. And there is video evidence somewhere. So, uh, Awana, I'm just going to hand it over to you now, allow you to ask some questions to, to you, sir, about okay. sustainability, I believe. Uh, yes, uh, our topic today is sustainability. But before that, uh, we would like to welcome our amazing guest today. So we have here Jutta Eckstein. Um, Jutta, would you like to, to kind of like um, introduce yourself or? Sure, yeah, I'm happy to. Um... And you need to stop me if I go too long. Sometimes I do that. <laughs> so um, see, I wonder even where I start with my background. So probably in, in the field I'm in right now, I started as a programmer. So I was uh, like developing software. And in, uh, I think, 96, I learned about extreme programming. And since 97, then like, we started using it on our project. Maybe what's also interesting there was um, perhaps a year later or so, I was also on a project where, some, where the manager said, oh, you say, I don't know what it really is, but since you are there, something has changed for the better, which made me think that perhaps I can offer something in addition to be a developer. And this kind of started my path to, to different areas, which was like, well, can I, first it was more like, software design and architecture, and then it was more in the direction of team lead. Um, well, Agile came up in 2001, which I used and, and tried actually in 2002 to scale up, and wrote the very first book on scaling Agile, which was published in 2004. Nobody was interested in that at the time. Um, yeah, and went on to, like, whenever I did my next milestone, I also kind of wrote about it. So the scaling was one thing. The other thing was uh, like in a distributed setting, what, what does it do with Azure? Also, this was too early. Um, then I went on to what, what's going on in organizations and looked at, speaking of where we met, how retrospectives can actually help for organizational change. So moving it up and out from the team level and also together with Johanna Rothman, I wrote on cost of delay. And then my last book is on company-wide agility. So, so really, it, the books kind of mark my journey. And the next one that's not written yet <laughs> is on sustainability, for sure. 
Oh, perfect. <laughs> Amazing transition also to our topic. Thank you so much, Yuta, for this beautiful introduction. Um, so yes, as we already uh, settled, our topic is sustainability for today's podcast. I have uh, gathered some definitions online and um, the favorite one that, which I found is that sustainability is a social goal um, about the ability of people to coexist on earth over a long period of time. So I wanted to ask you, Yuta, would you like to add anything to this uh, definition? Mm -hmm. I, I like that definition. It's very much in line with the very first definition that was uh, made. This is the Bundland definition, where, which focuses on kind of our responsibility for future generations so that we cannot live at the cost of them. I, I like this very much. And I often struggle with this definition and what does it really mean in my daily work? So this is where I'm really at. I want to make it super tangible for all of us who are like in the agile community, people who are working as like software developers or on any kind of team level in any kind of role. And for that, I often look more at, at this, what's called the, the um, three pillar model, which has a social angle, an environmental angle and an economic angle. And like the first one, the social one, and I'm trying to, to switch this already to what it could mean in, in software. This is then about, for example, making the software accessible to people, which we not often do, mm, ensuring everyone can use it also depending on where I'm from. So uh, whatever is there, so also inclusion is part of that. Then environmental, of course, we probably should also look what's the carbon footprint of the system. And then from an economic perspective, it, it means, well, the definition for that is improving the life of everyone everywhere and questioning if the software that we are writing is really doing that. Is it really helping the world? Kind of also how you started with the definition you found. Yeah, do, do we have a positive impact on the world or not and we just often don't ask that question mm -hmm. that's true yeah i also believe uh, with some some of us tend to focus uh, on the short term and we lose sight of the long-term consequences, for example. Um, speaking of which, uh, I also wanted to ask you, Jutta, uh, what are the biggest mistakes uh, teams and companies keep making at the moment which you have encountered maybe that threaten sustainability a lot? I, it's always difficult to say like, um, <laughs> what's the biggest? I don't know if it's yeah, really yeah. biggest, but, yeah. but anyway, some of, some of the biggest. So, yeah. <laughs> so I like the way you introduced that because that's often what I feel is a kind of a myth that people think if we are using agile and, and maybe particularly scrum, but I think it's overall agile, that this is focusing long term and that it's a bad idea to think short term, I meant, and it's a bad idea to think long term. So that we only consider the next two weeks and this is what we plan for, this is what we are doing and, and we forget everything else. And I think this is a big myth and it was never meant that way. And it also, it, it shouldn't be done that way. And just to kind of think of one thing, um, well, maybe going back to the retrospective. If we are running a retrospective after two weeks and look at what are we learning from those two weeks, then the learning makes only sense if we also have a long-term idea. Because if, if we don't know where we need to go, what needs to happen in the future, then anything we do could be the right thing. You know, any direction could be the right direction. And so the, the thing is really, we should not ignore that Agile always has as well this long-term perspective. And this then again comes back to like future generations or, or long-term maybe usage of 
of the system. So this is like one thing which is particularly um, in actual a thing. Another thing that I find really, really difficult is that we keep um, creating systems where we typically assume that the clients have the, has the latest hardware. And with that assumption, what we are doing is actually we are contributing to electronic waste because very often the hardware is thrown out because there's no software running on it anymore. And to make this maybe more yeah, clearer for everyone, I guess for for everyone with the phone, this is typically what's happening. You buy a new phone because the software is not really supported on the phone anymore. And the same is true with our clients. So they throw out those servers and whatever because we don't support this anymore with our software. So we also need to look more also here, maybe more long term and, and ensure that it's also running on older devices. And I don't know, probably I could go on and on, but I but let's say let's stop at these two. Well, those are amazing points. Uh, and I, I was a bit shocked while you were mentioning those, how you know how I encountered them also in my daily life. Like it's not just <laughs> at work or something, yeah. It's a bit scary. <laughs> but I think it's very yeah. important that we talk about it and uh, spread more awareness on this topic. Using the uh, the phone example you had there, I've noticed that in the UK in particular, I'm not sure if this is true of where you folks are, uh, in the past of the UK, it used to be the norm that mobile phones were bought on a contract and those contracts would be two years, 24 months. And even if that phone was still in perfect working order, people would just get rid of it to get the latest new phone. Uh, and there's been a movement towards mobile phones uh, lasting three years now and being sold on 36 months contracts. So we're not throwing out as much wasteful tech because those phones are still perfectly good working order. We don't necessarily need to have the, the latest shiny new one every time. This is interesting. So yes, that's also true for Germany. This is where I'm based. And the interesting thing, I never really thought about that. I never played that game. Because, and, and this is maybe more, I don't know, I just like to be independent. I don't want to have those contracts that tell me what I need to do. So I, I never had the phone attached to the contract, which of course then also means sometimes you pay more for a phone, so it has a price. Um, but I was also always able flexibly changing contracts if, if I think like, well, they are not doing a good job. But yes, that also has the consequence that you can use the phone much longer. And yeah, so that could be also a possibility, but I also understand if people say that uh, that's a huge price and, and maybe mm -hmm. too difficult. And yeah, just to build on that a little bit further, I, I, I suspect that maybe the reason people were chopping and changing these phones so frequently and getting new contracts is perhaps because they didn't have the, the money to be able to buy the phone outright. Mm. And therefore, they were they needed to be able to uh, put mm. on a contract in the spaces. And the the contracting mechanism of a two year duration was actually forcing or was acting as a a, a, a driving factor towards people refreshing these phones every few years, rather than mm. yeah having longer contracts. So it's just yeah, it's oh, just an well. interesting parallel. Now you are getting in the direction that's kind of dangerous because. The, the thing is, I completely agree. So first of all, this. But the dangerous field we are getting at is, well, why is that? Well, it is because our whole economy relies on growth. Mm. And if we go there, so I, well, as much as I think this is probably not the best idea for our planet, I'm not sure if I will go on that fight because that, that's too much a fight. But I can kind of increase the awareness of what it is that we are all doing in our daily life and how we can make a difference. And perhaps at times also not playing that game as, as you also suggest with the phone. So maybe now with that the regulations are not as strict anymore or maybe even doing what, what I said that I 
didn't even go for that contract. But yes, you, uh, the money is what you also need to have in order to do that too. So freedom to make your own decisions. Yeah. Hmm. And you said, I've just got a, a question for you. And it was, it's because I, I've heard you mention a couple of phrases or words a, a few times now. You, you've alluded to kind of the, the habits on a, on a daily basis. Mm. And I think this is where I'm really keen to hear what are the, the habits, the routines, the rituals, those, those small actions, those 1% gains that people could do to help, help with sustainability? So that it is mm-hmm. anchored to reality and back to back to you as an individual. Mm-hmm. So again, my my starting point is the teams, typically the agile teams, working on a product. And where I'm at right now is that I think we need to start changing the conversation. We need to start asking different questions in order to bring sustainability into those daily habits. And one of the things that my, my absolute favorite statement or, or question is whenever we do something, it could be we are prioritizing stories or we are looking at how do we implement them or we are looking at the ethics or, or something. If every now and then we ask, how would that differ if we understand that the planet is a stakeholder in the same way as everyone else is a stakeholder as we know who wants the product and so on. And by doing this, sometimes I see that, well, the priorities might change, maybe the way we are implementing it changes. So it does have an effect and it, it starts like, yeah, triggering a different conversation. And another thing that I find really powerful, which goes more in the social area, which is um, that we, well, typically we, we use it in Agile, well, not typically, whatever. A lot of people use personas in Agile, so for, in order to know what is the target group, which I think is also important to do so, that, you know, you are developing the product for the right people or markets. Yet, it's helpful to every once in a while to come up with the complete opposite persona for ensuring that what you're coming up with is not excluding people. Because we might be so much looking into this white young male and forget like everything else that's that's going on. And and stuff is happening like that. Well there are there's just too many examples out there. Like the the one thing um that I've seen that um, for a system that required a registration that the last name asked for at least three characters for the last name. Well, that is true if I think my persona is probably here in, in Europe or whatever, but if it's more in Asia, there are so many people with the two characters last name. So if I just start thinking of somebody who is not like our typical audience, I will, it's more likely I ensure it's also usable by other people. Sounds like a really powerful exercise, it's like a persona role play. Mm-hmm. Have, have mm-hmm. your team say, you are, today you're gonna act as this persona, we're gonna act as this persona, and we'll, we'll just have a conversation and see uh, what different things come out from a sustainability and accessibility perspective. Yes, exactly. And and I'm not suggesting, I, I want to repeat that, I'm not suggesting not to have like your target audience, target market represented by a persona. But in order to be inclusive and, and making it accessible, kind of thinking of it from an opposite direction sometimes is really super helpful. I love that. I love that how you emphasize um, accessibility as being an important thing to take into account for the teams. Uh, And Yuta, I remember uh, in the beginning, you said there is this myth about agile not focusing on the long term goal or vision. Um, But maybe we could have a look at it from the other perspective. Like, uh, do you think um, that agile is uh, is very important, maybe for sustainability, or how how um, how 
can we use it you know to to mm -hmm. react faster maybe to uh, make um you know more helpful steps uh, for sustainability mm -hmm. and the environment so this question opens up a whole box <laughs> very <laughs> this good. Is good this is really good yeah um so the one thing that i'm seeing is that agile actually triggers expectations in towards sustainability and if we stick with like the the topic we just had with inclusion and accessibility just uh, saying if if you know a team that says oh we are agile and then you find out they are not inclusive people would say well i thought you're agile and it doesn't really say anywhere you know but there is this expectation and this is also true on the company level when when well we figure out they are not paying fairly, but they say they are agile, or even if it's something that's perhaps far away from software development, but if they pollute the water or something, people would start questioning that because for whatever reason, agile is supposed to take care as well of the ecosystem it, it sits in. So this is kind of the, the one thing that I believe that this is why Agile is really um, almost determined to, to work more on that. Um, another thing is that, well, that whole topic about, let's put it even broader, planetary challenges is a wicked complex problem. Now we in Agile, we keep saying, this is what Agile is for. We know how to deal with complexity. At least that's what we say. You know, we, we kind of, we have these different models that we learn from like Kinefin or whatever. And we know that perhaps the, the best idea is to make like one increment and then uh, look back and see, does it help us or not? And if not, then do something different. So this probing approach or this like we reflect hypothesize experiment and then keep learning keep going well this is basically the the way we can we can tackle that problem so i think we also have dual tools at our fingertips that can help us all to make a difference and um we we also differentiate here actually between like when we say um, sustainability in or sustainability by Agile. And what I'm talking about is right now, it's more like by Agile. So with all the practices, tools, mindset we have at hand, we can make a difference. And um, I, I know several people who are doing that and there are, there are stuff out there like, well, you can think of joining the developers for future could be one thing or I know a colleague of mine, Nicole Bellilos, she helped Hack Your Future, which is a nonprofit organization supporting refugees in a way that they um, can show their IT skills in order to have, have it easier to get a job. So they can just practice their skills and then they can show it through the Hack Your Future and this helps them to get that job. Now, Nicole helped them as a Scrum Master to do exactly that. So this is again kind of using our skills that we are having. Um, another example was uh, a colleague of mine, Steve Holger and I, we last year worked for a nonprofit organization in environmentalism. And we, again, we just used what we what we know like story mapping event storming open space and help them to do their next steps this way so there's stuff there and then sustainability in agile is more like well can we ensure that what we are developing doesn't do any harm can we for example start looking or including in our definition of done what is actually the carbon footprint of our system here does it increase with every delivery or does it at least stay the same? Maybe it's even getting better. So stuff like that. So sometimes I refer to this even as, well, that's the homework we should do. And maybe this is even something we do, should do first because 
then we will be more trustworthy than if we say, well, we know all that stuff, how you deal with complexity and let's help you, but we don't clean up our own house. You know, this is kind of the, yeah. I, in, 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 I got in goosebumps. <laughs> yeah. Damn, uh, heavy topics. <laughs> yes, yes, so, it is. It, it is a heavy topic, yeah. I'm intrigued. Do we think that there is a universally al you know, aligned understanding as to what sustainability means? Is there a definition of sustainability that we all buy into and understand? And do we do we need to start there? Perhaps does a team need a, a definition of sustainability before they have a definition of done? I, I think they do. Yes, I, I think this is this is again the thing that changes the conversation we are having while we are building the product we are building and um i'm not sure if you're asking if there's like an official definition of sustainability um there are many and you can say well this is bad but maybe this is also good because you can then say well use one of them they're all, all kind of good but use one of them you can work with that's that's why I prefer this three pillar model because it speaks more to what I'm what I'm doing than, for example, if I look at the seventeen SDGs, the Sustainable Development Goals by the United Nations, which is probably the most comprehensive one. But if I read their zero hunger, then I'm I'm sorry, I know not everyone. Is, as a, like has that good life I'm having, but still, when I think of the software that I'm creating with the teams I'm working with, I'm not sure what we really can do in our professional life with that. Of course, we can also look at perhaps we are not we are ensuring not to waste as much food and and stuff like that. But I always try to bring it down to what are we doing in our actual community. And what can we do to make a difference? And therefore, this, the sustainable development goals, they are often for me too far away from what I am doing. And I, again, I, I want to ensure they are important. They are super important. But they are, I feel they are not helpful for my work. Mm. I think the, the crux of my question there wasn't necessarily that there wasn't a single definition or there, wasn't a, there, weren't, there weren't multiple definitions out there. It was more that if we bring this down to a, a team, a, a company, do they have a their their own collective team or company level understanding of what definition, um, what, what sustainability means to us, and how we use that definition to drive us going forward? So I get, I guess, a bit like you were saying there, if you had a situation where awareness, the the company, the team could be looking at these. 17 sustainability goals and saying, well, which of these can we impact on a daily basis? Which ones mm -hmm. are things that we can influence and which ones can we use to drive us going forward? So I was, I was trying to understand whether there was something, a model, an approach or a way of getting mm -hmm. the teams to mm -hmm. be thinking about that. Well, I, I think, yes, it should be this way. Um, the problem that I most often see when working with companies who are even aware of sustainability and they do stuff, then what's typically happening is that they they do uh, create the what's called the ESG report, which is ESG stands for environmental, social, governmental, and this is a reporting structure, um, which is good. And often they come up with stuff like, oh, let's reduce the company cars and offer bikes or um, ensure that the light is switched off at night or it, it can be all kinds of stuff like that. Seldom I see that what's happening there also in this report is connected what's done on the team level. And putting it even more extreme, if I think of this is a company that's a software company. So it's then disconnected from the value stream. And so coming back to your question, the sustainability definition that we should have on the team level would then also help 
to bridge that gap or to make a connection to what's going on 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 a different level, which is also again it's also important, but but just ensuring that the value stream also takes sustainability into account. And yes, then you can think of maybe again we use what we learned and it's working at least at some places, maybe not at all. You can build this in in OKRs, for example. Mm. Like the sound of that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, actually, this is something that. Um, we or I've co-created with two other people, Claudia Melo and again Steve Hollier, which is an assessment that the teams can use in order to find out where they are standing with sustainability and what could be their next step. And exactly oh. doing something like this can help to exactly bridge that gap. So there, there are tools out there, not many, at least that, that's the only one I'm aware of, but I guess this will change over time. There are more out there for like the overall company level, but I am not aware of anything that brings it down to like the individual and team level. So, and this is um, what we created. And it's, um, and I'm happy to, of course to share the link. It, um, it's published under Creative Commons, so it's also available for people. Please do. I wonder if we can turn that into some sort of, because I'm a very visual person. I love these canvases, these templates. I wonder if there's a way of turning that into some sort of team workshop style exercise where they can just very easily and visually see where they are on their journey and make a plan for what could be next. Mm -hmm. I like that. And this reminds me on something else. So different to most of the stuff I've worked on in my career. Well, I'm, I'm kind of old. So starting with Never. orientation oh, and well, I'm experienced. Let's put it That's this more way. like so it. There we go. With, yeah, starting with object orientation or patterns and agile. All of that stuff has been created in industry mainly. Now what I am seeing with sustainability, a lot is going on in research. So they are more leading or uh, paving the way. And kind of what you are asking for, there are templates out there from research that are doing exactly this. The one is what I'm aware of, um, the sustainability or it's called sustainable business canvas, I believe, which uh, has like two additional layers on the business canvas uh, created by Osterwalder, is that the correct name? And so puts on top two other layers like the, because that's the economic, what what the classical one is, so also the social and the environmental one. Then there is a, another group of people who've, who's created uh, a framework that used four workshops exactly, where you keep going and looking at these different areas. But all of that sits in research, which sometimes means, well, maybe it's not as pragmatic as it could be, or sometimes it could mean, well, it has only been tested in research as well. But for me, it seems, and now I'm not sure, I'm not having friends now in research anymore, and they are my friends, actually. For me, this is kind of the first time something new is created, and it's more driven, driven from research than from industry. And that's kind of cool, I think. Whereas in the past, like in Agile, I think it was always research was kind of come following behind and then proving that pair programming is helping or whatever, what we done and kind of felt quite for some time, right? And here it's the other way around, which then asks of us that we also listen and, and look what's there. And, and perhaps there is that other thing, which I also will share a link about. So I've uh, created an initiative within the Agile Alliance, which is called Agile Sustainability. And what we exactly want to do to, to make these things more accessible. We're kind of at the start still, so there is not a lot right now there, but we, on the one hand, we look for people who help us. And on the other hand, 
um, I think it will be tricky now because so much is going on right now that more stuff will be available there for, for people to use and to make sustainability as part of their professional life. Oh, you, you beat me to the punch because that's what I was going to bring up. I was going to say, hey, there's this Agile Sustainability Initiative that you're part of, Yuta, and one of the activities is awareness. And I was going to do my part by raising awareness for it by bringing it up here, but you, you mentioned it first, <laughs> right. so caught me, caught me. <laughs> tell, cool. tell us more about that initiative. What, how, how will it work? So we, awareness is, is one of the activities. What, what else is that? That is true, yeah. So... um. We think of the awareness really in various ways. So, for example, because we are also attached to the Agile Alliance, it, it can also be something which we are just starting. If uh, people run a meetup or a conference and they ask for sponsorship of the Agile Alliance, then one of our ideas is supporting them in, on the one hand, providing links to how they can make the event maybe more sustainable, but also to trigger, motivate, whatever, that they make sustainability really a topic because this is the topic is still new in the Agile community and there's still so much to learn. And so we we really have to use all those meetup conferences and so on to make progress in the topic as well. So and this is what we want to do is kind of make a connection there. And this is um, well, what we managed to do at least uh, partially good, partially so-so for the two bigger conferences with the Agile Alliance, like with the XP conference that's coming up in uh, June in Amsterdam. So their sustainability is really a huge topic now, also with the help from the initiative. And then with the Agile, the big Agile conference that's in Orlando, one of the things that was really part of also what the, I don't know, part of the questions we kept asking was the idea that it's now not only in Orlando, but there's also that Scotland experience that not everyone, especially from Europe, needs to fly to the US. So there, there's stuff already going on. And still, I would say we are at the beginning there and yeah um maybe that other thing is what i said with this assessment we also um want to make it more accessible through the initiative maybe in a more reduced format um because we know some people struggle with the platform um and so we just want to provide it as a whatever excel or google sheet and so it's easy to use for everyone and and doesn't need like long introductions how do we use that really sounds like some great options and you have some links to share with us that i will ensure yeah. our listeners are aware of and can access after the show now i'm very very aware that i feel like i've dominated some of the questions recently so i want to throw it back to my my virtual well virtually <laughs> back to my co-host Oana. what else have you got for for you to before we close up the show today um, yeah, uh, how, how much time do we still have so I can manage my questions? <laughs> uh, let's, let's give it another five minutes or so, maybe one more good question. Okay, okay, great. Then I'm going to choose the, the important, most important one. So um, I'm thinking about our listeners and I think uh, if, if they are feeling like I do right now, I think they are super motivated right now. I think they are thinking maybe, oh yes, I fully agree and I completely uh, feel this topic. Um, but but what can I do about it right now? So maybe we could just uh, wrap it up at the end uh, with what what could uh, you know like each and every one of us start doing. I, I had some ideas. Um, maybe you know uh, start to gather some some knowledge on this topic and then try to bring it to the team <laughs> to, the, mm -hmm. to the rest of the team. Maybe organize some kind of uh, sustainability training or hire some uh, experts to to teach us about um, as, you know accessibility but those are just some wild ideas I wanted to mm -hmm. ask you Yuta what what would you say so I really have the impression that uh, starting with this survey with this assessment is often a really big help because but, but I know also for myself, this topic, well, we said it already, it's so complex, it's wicked, and so it, often we feel overwhelmed. And the question is then, 
well, maybe I cannot make a difference. What can little me do about this? So, or where to start and so on. And this assessment seems to help people to kind of just, in a way they are used to do stuff, come up with the next step. And then, because you can also run the assessment and at a later point in time, you can also figure out, did we improve this? Is it any better than it was before? So this is really something. Um, another thing is that, well, depending on where you are, but especially for uh, the listeners in Europe, the thing is since January 1st, 2023, so this year and just a couple of months ago, there's this regulation from the EU that's asking all companies that are bigger than 250 people to not only report on finances, but also on their progress in sustainability. So what is their effort? What are they doing? And so if you are working in a company that has that size, then one thing is you can start asking what's happening there, who is actually doing that, and how can we connect? and then helping to really implement sustainability throughout the whole organization. So sometimes people are not really aware that something is already going on because it's on a different level, I assume. Well, and maybe they see that, that sign saying, oh, switch off the light or something, but uh, that perhaps, well, it's also helping, but that's maybe too small or something that has been there before or so. And um, well, another thing, which is uh, maybe going back to the phone, is the most important thing we individually can do and also helping our clients to do is reducing what we are using. So they're always, if we talk about sustainability, it comes with these three terms, reduce, reuse, recycle. And the thing that has the biggest impact is reducing. So maybe you can think of, can you use your phone a little bit longer? Do you really need that new notepad or can you keep it? The, the problem with that is, and this has really changed over the last years, is that in the past, the biggest footprint of the products we were using had been created by using them. So if you think of a laundry machine or a fridge, it was using it that created that carbon footprint. And now things have changed. Things have changed in that way that the biggest carbon footprint, actually it's exactly 80% of the carbon footprint is now created during creation of the product. So if you think of your wow. phone, 80% of the carbon footprint is created for creating that phone. So even if you think, oh, perhaps I use solar power to charge my phone, well, it doesn't make a huge difference. It mm -hmm. makes a difference if you keep it longer. And that's, well, actually maybe true for everything. And I'm not sure if we should leave the field. I know we want to close it, but if you think of fashion, the whole fashion industry has a carbon footprint as the whole transportation. So ships, planes, cars, trucks, all together. That's oh my the gosh. fashion industry, same footprint. So if you just keep using your stuff as best as you can, that's good. So reuse is where you can start in, in all area. If you could see my feet right now, you'd say I've got holes in my socks. So clearly I'm, I'm <laughs> awful. Very good. Very good. <laughs> now you have even a, a marketing thing with you there and say, look, <laughs> these are my socks because sustainability. <laughs> Very good. Well, I'll, wear the, I'll wear them proudly and I'll use that as an example next time. Very good. <laughs> well, thank you so much for this hands-on uh, tips and suggestions, Yuta. I, you know, like, I, I feel so motivated right now. I, I think our listeners will love this episode. <laughs> I hope, I hope so. each of them take something away. I certainly have. It's been an absolute pleasure having both of you on the show today. I'm really keen to hear from our listeners what they think about the new format, having a, having a co-host. First and foremost, how was your experience co-hosting a show, Oana? <laughs> um, 
It was very, very cool. So I, I loved it and I was absorbed in the conversation. So maybe that's that was a bit challenging because I was so absorbed in the conversation. I actually wanted to take notes, <laughs> but I thought, no, I won't do that. I do that when I listen to the episode. Now I'm the host, the co-host. So that was my I challenge. Blame, I have to blame uh, you two for being so engaging a speaker. <laughs> Absolutely. I'm really, really happy. Now. This was the first uh, episode I could <laughs> co-host. <laughs> so thank so you. So those time. of you listening, those of you that are listening, uh, please do give Awana some love for taking her first steps into the podcasting world. It does take courage to try something new, and that should always be applauded. And she's done a fantastic job. Yuta, is there anything else you'd like to leave our listeners with? We've alluded to some links, but where should they find more about you, your work and sustainability? I guess the easiest to reach out to me is through LinkedIn. And I definitely will provide all the various links there. I also keep, um, well, I have a section on my website called sustainability where I kind of put more emphasis on that and not on the general echo stuff. So there's also stuff to find there. So um, I definitely will, will share all, the, all those links. Perfect. Those links will go out when the show does. Now, don't forget to follow or subscribe to the show so you don't miss future episodes and sharing is caring. So if you have found value in listening this sh to the show today, hurl it virtually towards someone else so they can benefit from it too. And as always, folks, don't stop believing. Thanks for being involved. <laughs>